I'm glad you could join me again. I'm Gavin McLeod. Perhaps being the down under continent is what makes Australia so very different. Instead of shedding their leaves, some Australian trees shed their bark. The puzzling duck-billed platypus, an Australian native, lays eggs like a duck but suckles its young like a mammal. Some of Australia's kangaroos climb trees. And when an Australian speaks of a salty, he doesn't mean a peanut. He means the native saltwater crocodile. And down under a waterhole is a billabong. But Australia is spectacular. The ever-changing spectacle of this continent unfolds in its national parks, ranging from the Great Barrier Reef, the largest living thing on Earth, to the wilds of tropical Queensland, to glacial Alps, to the forested mountains of the island of Tasmania. Australia's parks are its natural down-under glories. Australia, the most ancient continent, has some of the world's most beautiful national parks. In this film we will see six of these parks. Each is a living link with the past, both near and far. Each park has its own story to tell. And together their stories will form a history of Australia from a time before the dinosaurs up to the present day. So we will see the ancient rainforests of the Dane Tree, the enchanting underworld of the Great Barrier Reef, the white wilderness of the Australian Alps, the majestic beauty of Western Tasmania, the magical landscapes of the Kakadu, and the awesome power of Uluru. We are earnest to explore and learn all things. We require that all things be mysterious, unexplorable, that land and sea be infinitely wild, unsurveyed and unfathomed. We can never have enough of nature. In wildness is the preservation of the world. With those words, Henry David Thoreau, the great American writer, expressed the philosophy of wildlife conservationists of today. Poets, philosophers, and ordinary people saw great beauty in the natural world. Their efforts led in 1874 to the formation of the world's first national park, Yellowstone in Wyoming, the United States. Seven years later, Australia followed suit, dedicating the world's second national park at Port Hacking, New South Wales. Australians define a national park as a relatively large protected area of unspoiled natural landscape set aside for public enjoyment, education and inspiration. Daintree National Park on Australia's northeastern coast is such a place. Located 50 miles north of the Queensland town of Cairns, this park of 65 square miles was established in 1966. It is one of only two places in the world where tropical rainforest meets coral reef. The rainforest is Australia's living link to an ancient past. Two hundred million years ago, the world's two great land masses were joined. Together they formed one supercontinent, 
that stretched from pole to pole. After 30 million years, they drifted apart. Australia was located in Gondwana, the southern continent. It was wet and warm, covered in a dense rainforest that swarmed with insects, butterflies, and wildlife. Then Gondwana started to break up. Africa first, followed by India, New Zealand, and then Australia, about 80 million years ago. But gradually, as the world's climate grew warmer and drier, the rainforests gave way to drier woodlands and grassy plains, except along Australia's eastern coast. Here, an uplift of mountains thrust the remnants of the forest upwards into a wetter zone of heavy rainfall and high humidity. These are some of the last remnants of lowland tropical rainforest in the world. And the Daintree is a living museum of a past that goes back long before the arrival of man on our planet. Today, there are many reminders of these ancient origins. This simple seed, Idiosperma australiensis, is among the world's first flowering plants and has survived unchanged for 135 million years. forest is the cradle of evolution and one of the world's most diverse living systems. In an area that covers only one thousandth of the Earth's surface, it is home to half of the world's ten million species of plants and animals. No matter how strongly the sun shines above the canopy, on the forest floor there's an impression of a pale green filtered light. It's amazing how well rainforest plants have adapted. The seeds of the strangler fig germinate high up in another tree, then send down roots that promote its own growth, eventually strangling its host. Climbing vines with slender stems use the support of other trees to find light, creating tangles of looping, twisting lianas thrusting upwards. The rainforest is so rich, it's a treasure trove of animals, insects, and birds. The male rifle bird puts a great deal of thought and energy into attracting a female. He squawks loudly, shrouds his wings importantly, doing a sort of courtship dance to attract the female. The satin bower bird is similarly motivated. Unlike the female, he has brilliant blue plumage and collects objects of a similar color, one that is reputedly irresistible to the female. And so he builds his bower of twigs, decorated with berries, flowers, and feathers, all designed to attract and woo as many females as possible in a season. His efforts are rewarded, and two new bowerbirds are born to the rainforest. The Daintree is rich in mammals, some of them found nowhere else in the world. Like the tree kangaroo. And the Daintree River ringtail possum. The Australian emu 
and the cassowary, like the African ostrich, are large flightless birds. This suggests a living link to a time when Australia and Africa were joined together many millions of years ago. For tens of thousands of years, Aborigines lived here. They hunted small animals and birds and gathered an abundance of nuts and fruits. The Kuku Yalanji people of this region believed that this was the land of their genesis. And their legends tell of how the features of the landscape, the tides and the moon, had their beginnings. They lived simply, in harmony with the bountiful rainforest. All this was to change with the coming of the white man. Richard Daintree, after whom the park is named, was a geologist and prospector who came in search of gold. And gold there was. Christy Palmerston, the son of an Italian revolutionary and an opera singer from Van Diemen's Land, was known as the Buccaneer. Gold digger and explorer, he was hated by the Chinese whom he ruthlessly exploited, but loved by the Aborigines with whom he shared a deep respect and understanding. In 1882, when his close Aboriginal friend Pompo died, Palmerston wrote, It is with an overwhelming sense of grief and swimming eyes I copied these lines. It is not in me to express how much this little Aborigine had endeared himself to me through the darkest scenes of my life, sickness, famine, adversity, and saved me from death several times while exploring the wilds of North Queensland. Hard on the heels of the gold diggers came tin miners, timber cutters, pastoralists, and farmers, all of whom left in their wake large tracts of cleared rainforest. There's no shortage of sugar in these rich Queensland cane fields. Before the crop is harvested, a controlled fire burns off the rubbish and trash, leaving the green cane stalks unharmed and much easier to cut. The cane cutters mow down the fields with apparent ease, but this work is tough and earns a skilled man better than six pounds a day. And brother, that's real sugar. Much of the original rainforest was destroyed, but fortunately at least 30% has survived. Some of it set aside as national parklands for the enjoyment of all. There have been protests on the part of conservationists to protect the rainforest from the ravages of logging, roads and development. The balance is delicate and difficult to achieve. But the Daintree is still one of the most beautiful and important rainforests in the world. Exotic, enchanting, and accessible to all who wish to explore its ancient beauty. A green turtle early in the summer. She's a meter across and weighs around 650 pounds. She digs a hole in which to lay anything from 50 to 150 eggs. In two to three months, the eggs will hatch, but only a handful of the young turtles will reach maturity, falling prey to predators, gulls, birds, crabs, and reef sharks. Six of the world's seven species of turtle live here in the Great Barrier Reef. There are 240 types of birds, 400 forms of coral, and thousands of shellfish, crustaceans, sea slugs, worms, and other species of underwater life. The reef runs for 1,200 miles down the tropical east coast of Australia, and is about twice the size of England. It's the largest system of coral reefs in the world, and is even visible from the moon. After the full moon in late spring or early summer each year, the barrier reef gives birth.
This rare footage shows vast numbers of corals all spawning at the same time, creating spectacular clouds of eggs and sperms up and down the length of the reef. The coral reef is alive. Corals are formed by small primitive animals, some of which create a hard surface by excreting lime. When they die, their skeletons harden and remain, gradually building up the reef layer upon layer. The Great Barrier Reef is not one reef, but a system of about 2,600 reefs. The actual barrier is the outer reef where the waves of the Coral Sea mark the edge of the Australian continent off the mainland. There are many fringing reefs too. These are attached to the mainland and to islands that mark the remnants of a mountain range that was submerged when sea levels rose at the end of the last ice age. The waters of the reef are home to fearsome creatures, great predators like the shark. Sea snakes, whose poison is said to be ten times more venomous than a king cobra's. Scorpion fish. And stinging jellyfish. Moray eels. And manta rays. And yet there's no known case here of a human being killed by a shark or a manta ray. Most of the shark species on the reef aren't dangerous. And the ominous looking manta ray is actually perfectly harmless. Without even so much as a barb on its lethal looking tail. Many of the creatures who strike terror in bold hearts are actually quite shy and gentle and can be approached by experienced divers who understand their ways. Aborigines have lived in this region longer than the reef itself. They collected shellfish, speared turtle, and built ingenious tidal fish traps, as their ancestors did before them. Some were said to be headhunters, like the fierce warriors of the Torres Strait in their 80-foot-long outrigger canoes. By the mid-17th century, the Dutch had carefully charted most of the Australian coastline, except for the east coast. Their exploration uncovered no jewels, no gold, no silk, no spices. They lost interest. In 1770, the Englishman James Cook of His Majesty's ship, the Endeavour, approached Australia from the southeast. With only the crudest of navigational aids, he was able to chart the unknown east coast and lay claim to an entire continent. After Cook put the reef coast on the map, Europeans began to tap its riches. They hired Aborigines, Asians and Pacific Islanders to help them plunder the seas. Pearls and the pearl shell formed a basis for lucrative trade. With its clear, calm waters and dazzling white sand beaches, the reef has long been a pleasure ground for holiday makers. It offered an escape that was simple and uncomplicated. 
Although today, standing on turtles is no longer allowed. The reef is still a nature wonderland, but there have been a number of environmental problems, many due to increased development. There has been pollution by super tankers and concern about overfishing. Elsewhere, a natural predator, the crown of thorn starfish, has attacked and destroyed coral on a large scale. To protect and take care of the area, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority was set up in 1975. They've created a zoning system which allows the park to be used for a variety of purposes. These range from total protection to tourism, scientific research, and areas for commercial fishing and exploration. The reef today is one of the great wonders of our natural world, a national and international treasure available for all to enjoy. from Snowy River, up by Kosciuszko side, where the hills are twice as steep and twice as rough, where a horse's hoof strike firelight from the Flintstones every stride, the man that holds his own is good enough. The Man from Snowy River is an epic poem by Banjo Patterson about the legendary stockman of the Australian Alps. It tells the story of a daring young horseman who single-handedly recaptures a prized colt to join the wild bush horses of the high country. He sent the flint stones flying, but the pony kept its feet. He cleared the fallen timber in his stride, and the man from Snowy River never shifted in his seat. It was grand to see that mountain horseman ride. The man from Snowy River is part of mythic Australia, but the wild bush horses still roam the Alps, the rooftop of Australia, which form a spectacular setting for Kosciuszko National Park. The park, with an area of 2,600 square miles, was first set aside as a nature reserve in 1944. It's the only part of the Australian mainland moulded by the great glaciers of the last ice age. Older than the Andes, the Rockies or the Himalayas, the Alps date back 500 million years. Mostly a high plateau region, the uplands are the birthplace of the Snowy River. They include limestone caves, alpine woodlands and sparkling mountain streams. Summers can be very hot. Winters bitterly cold. The Alps are also the home of many rare and fragile plants and animals who are well adapted to the extreme conditions. The corroboree frog lives in the alpine bogs of the Snowy Mountains. Discovered only in 1947, this striking creature is unable to change its brilliant colorings, unlike so many of its amphibian relatives. Shy and secretive, the female lays her eggs in deep burrows of sphagnum moss. The eggs are then guarded by the male.
Early European settlers longed to know the mysteries of what lay inside the majestic yet seemingly impenetrable snowlands. The explorers William Hovell and Hamilton Hume were forced to skirt around the higher mountain areas. At the end of seven miles, a prospect came in view. The most magnificent, immense high mountain, covered nearly one-fourth of the way down with snow, and the sun shining upon it gave it a most brilliant appearance. So wrote William Hovell in his diary of November 1824. Graziers and settlers followed in the 1830s. It was a land of granite mountains, deep rivers and high plains, and it claimed the lives of many a flock of sheep or mob of cattle. Late one afternoon in March 1840, a Polish explorer, Paul de Strzelecki, climbed the highest peak alone. At 7,250 feet, he called it Mount Kosciuszko, after his hero, Tadeusz Kosciuszko, the Polish general and patriot who had also fought in the American War of Independence. In the 1860s, the gold rush attracted fortune seekers from all over the world. Each man had his dream, and each place told its story. Dead Horse Gap, Bullock Head Creek, New Chum Hill. Norwegian miners first brought skiing to the mountains. The Kyandra Snowshoe Club, said to be the world's oldest ski club, was formed here in 1878 or so. Today, the Snowies are Australia's skiing playground with seven modern ski resorts to cater for this fast-growing sport. For those who wish to get away from it all, the snowlands also offer the opportunity for a quieter look at the land. Strzelecki, who first saw the potential of the Snowies to irrigate the dry western plains. More than a hundred years later, work began on a system of dams and tunnels to provide water and power to vast areas of eastern Australia. In its time, the Snowy Mountain Scheme was one of the world's great engineering achievements, though it was not without its moments of danger. The Snowy Mountain Scheme was completed in 1974 and its builders left to start new lives in Australia's towns and cities. Despite the effects this massive development had on the region, its character has remained essentially unspoiled. southern New South Wales, hundreds of cattle leave home for their annual holiday, a trek to summer pastures 3,000 feet up in the Australian Alps. The mountain cattlemen opened up the Alps, but their foraging hard-hooved beasts eroded the shallow mountain soil, altering a delicate natural balance. Finally, in 1967, grazing was removed from the park altogether. The stockmen are gone, but the myths remain. These days in the spring, bushwalkers come up to the mountains to see nature at its best. And the high country spreads out its blanket of wildflowers to welcome in the summer.
The story of Western Tasmania reads like an epic novel from Victor Hugo. This 1927 film depicts the grim experience of convict life in the penal colony of Macquarie Harbour. Convicts had to work in timber swamps, felling and dragging out Huon Pine, a renowned boat building timber. Runaways were probably the first white men to see the wild Franklin River upstream. But the area was inhospitable to those not familiar with it. The convict settlement was a disaster. And finally, in 1833, it was abandoned. Men have always experienced difficulty trying to tame the wild west and southwest of Tasmania, one of the world's last true wilderness areas. There are three national parks in the region, and the scenery in all three is spectacular. The landscape is dominated by rugged highlands. The mountains began to form a thousand million years ago, when great sandstone sediments were folded and heated under enormous pressure, forming the white quartzites and schists of towering pinnacles with names like Frenchman's Cap and Federation Peak. Up to 10,000 years ago, glaciers had gouged rugged peaks and ridges and left behind exquisite glacial lakes. Ancient river systems carved spectacular gorges, such as those at the Gordon and Franklin Rivers. With rushing rapids and beautifully tiered waterfalls, bordered by the dark, cool rainforest. Tasmanian myrtle, sassafras, king billy, and hewn pine. Giant trees up to two and three thousand years old, lone survivors of a prehistoric past that goes back more than 55 million years. These are the tallest forests in the southern hemisphere, and they contain plant species found nowhere else on our planet. Windswept button grass plains give way to alpine moorlands. And on the higher slopes, the Pandani is surrounded by a world in miniature of cushion plants, everlasting daisies, and small herbs. Tasmania is the home of a wide variety of animals, including the duckbill platypus, an egg-laying marsupial that carries its young in its pouch. The platypus is found in streams and rivers that flow through the temperate forests of eastern Australia and Tasmania. There are also ring-tail possums, sugar gliders, and many birds, such as the silver eye, the peregrine falcon, and the superb blue wren. Once the southwest was also the home of the now believed to be extinct Tasmanian tiger, a wolf-like marsupial hunter considered a threat to stock. By the early 1930s, the tiger had been trapped and hunted to extinction. 20,000 years ago, during the last ice age, hunter-gatherers lived here in caves. At that time, they were the southernmost people to inhabit the earth. Today, they are extinct. They were hunted and exterminated by white settlers. Miners, traders, farmers, pine cutters, sealers and whalers. Men who scoured the southwest for its bounty. But the land and the seas were difficult to prize open. Their treasures easily exhausted. 
It was a hard existence, and most left to seek quicker fortunes elsewhere. But there were others who fell in love with the land and stayed. Gustav Weindorfer, an Austrian migrant, was captivated by the rugged beauty of the highlands around Cradle Mountain. He dreamed of making it into a national park. On Christmas Day, 1912, he opened a holiday chalet in Cradle Valley and devoted much of his life to preserving the area for future generations. Sadly, he didn't live to see his dream come true. But in 1947, 12 years after his death, Cradle Valley was declared a national park. And today, many say his benign spirit still wanders this magical region. In modern times, a new wave of exploration began. The fierce rivers that had blocked development now aroused the interest of men who wished to tame the wilderness. Hydroelectric schemes were set up to convert the power of the water into usable electricity. Many objected to the damage these vast projects would inflict on the natural ecology. Lake Pedder, one of the most beautiful glacial lakes in Australia, was flooded for hydropower in 1972. And in 1976, Bob Brown, a young environmentalist, rafted the wild Franklin alone to draw people's attention to the irreplaceable beauty of its wilderness. A beauty that could now be forever altered. Six years later, the conservationists won an important battle when the Franklin Lower Gordon National Park was declared. And soon after, the key wilderness areas of the Wild Rivers, Cradle Valley, and the Southwest were recognized by the United Nations as World Heritage Areas of Universal Importance. Today, the Franklin still flows wild and free. The battle continues both against hydro schemes and the clearing of old growth forest for timber and pulp. Perhaps we are fortunate that this is a bleak and rugged country, mostly hostile to man. For it is this very quality that will help preserve its wildness for present and future generations. Billabongs are the home of the crocodile, cunning, ferocious killer, frightened of nothing on land or in the water. The professional crocodile hunters who now shoot along the rivers of the north use different methods and more modern equipment than the aborigines. They kill for the valuable skins and not for food. Bob Cutler's shooting team is one of the most successful in the Northern Territory. Crocodiles have been present on Earth for over a hundred million years. They are a living link to a primeval past, and the largest and most efficient survivor from the age of the dinosaurs. Up to 30 feet in length, the saltwater crocodile was prized by hunters for its beautifully patterned skin, and hunted almost to extinction. 
Now protected and flourishing again, the crocodile is the symbol of Kakadu, an ancient, supremely powerful creature that has survived immense changes in the physical and cultural landscape. Kakadu National Park is named after the Aboriginal people who live in this region. It is also known as the location for the filming of the well-known Australian film, Crocodile Dundee. Kakadu is Australia's largest and most diverse national park, 130 miles east of Darwin in Australia's tropical top end. The heart of Kakadu is a vast sandstone plateau formed 2,000 million years ago, when Australia was part of a single mighty continent that spanned the entire Earth. Massive faulting on the plateau created a dramatic escarpment with spectacular waterfalls, like Jim Jim, which cascades in a sheer drop of more than 600 feet to the black soil floodplains below. The character of Kakadu is dictated by a monsoonal climate with two distinct seasons, wet and dry. From May to November, the land is dry. The grass is brittle. There are no new shoots for the young kangaroos. And the birds have to venture further and further from their natural territory for food. Soon the northwest monsoon will come, bringing 50 inches of rain in a few short months. During the monsoon months, the wetlands of Kakadu become a paradise for birds. 80% of the world's magpie geese congregate here. The jabiru, Australia's only stork, forages for fish along the marshy shores of billabongs and lagoons. And jacanas, sea eagles, frogs, and egrets make the wetlands ring with song. The land was probably as rich and abundant 50 or more thousand years ago when the first humans arrived from the north. At that time, many of the channels separating Southeast Asia from the Australian continent were narrow and easily crossed on simple sea craft. The Aborigines were the first of a wave of immigrants who were to enter Australia. Food was plentiful in the tropical north making it the most densely settled part of Aboriginal Australia. At Kakadu, just 100 miles inland, the Aborigines created probably the greatest collection of ancient art the world has ever seen. The dry sandstone escarpment bordering the Arnhem Land Plateau has preserved 5,000 rock paintings of different styles up to 23,000 years old. Like the Dead Sea Scrolls, the work of these ancient artists provides a magnificent record of changing environments and Aboriginal life patterns over thousands of years. We know, for instance, that the Tasmanian tiger, now no longer found in this region, once lived here. And we see evidence of the square-rigged European ships which brought white men to the north, forever changing it. But even more importantly, the rock paintings confirm that the Aborigines were a wise and thoughtful people, masters of their own physical and spiritual universe. Many of these sites can be visited freely, but some are sacred, special places where the spirits of the powerful ancestors who fashioned the world still live. The Dutch are credited with the first official discovery of Arnhem Land in 1623. 
they weren't interested in this lonely alien region. Then in the early 1800s, the British, fearful of the possibility of French colonization, made two attempts to build military and trading outposts. They failed to cope with the extremes of climate and tropical disease, but they did leave their mark. Domesticated Asian buffalo were brought in for meat and hides, then turned loose when the British left. The buffalo grew huge, wild and ferocious, tearing up vast tracts of land with their great hooves, creating massive environmental damage. A new breed of men arose to commercially exploit the beasts. Buffalo hunters, tough, seasoned men who hunted the buffalo on horseback with handguns and rifles. Hey, 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 hey! Hey, 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 hey! Hey, 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 hey! Hey, 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 Then came the cattlemen, who exploited vast areas of the territory for beef production. Many Aborigines who had belonged to this land for centuries took up work on the cattle stations, where they excelled as horsebreakers and stockmen. But the isolation of the north and the difficulties of raising cattle in a tropical climate have made the great ranches a thing of the past. Today, the Aborigines have returned to Kakadu and now own it. Many have chosen to practice a way of life that includes traditional elements. Big Bill Niji is one of these. As well as advising the National Park's people on how to manage the land, Big Bill teaches the next generation about the value of this country and especially its spiritual importance. white fella come. He was a missionary whose cob broke down. I'd never seen a car or a camel, let alone a white fella. And I thought it was all some weird animal. To the Aborigines of the Western Desert, white people were a real puzzle. With all their awesome technology, they seemed not to understand the basics of managing the harsh desert country. Today, the Aborigines of the Uluru area jointly manage the park, bringing to it a fund of knowledge evolved over thousands of years of careful land management. Uluru is an Aboriginal national park. It's unique not only because of its two outstanding natural features, Ayers Rock and the Algas, but also because Uluru combines the best of two cultures in the way it is managed, the Aboriginal and the European. I think the rock is weird. That's, that's my first impression. It's, it's eerie. So far, it's nice. I'm just waiting for the sunset so I can see it change color. <laughs> I'm expecting to get bright red, and purple, and <laughs> all different kind of colors. For Anangu, their culture has always existed here. In the beginning, the world was unformed and featureless. Ancestral beings emerged from this void and journeyed widely, 
creating all the living species and the features of the desert landscape that we see today. Uluru, or Ayers Rock, and Katajuta, the Algas, are physical evidence of this creation. The European view of how this area was formed is quite different. Ayers Rock is a massive sandstone outcrop compressed from sediments laid down in a vast sea more than 600 million years ago, in the dawn of life on Earth. Forces from deep within the center of the earth twisted and tilted the massive block, exposing it to the wind and water. The softer rock was worn away, leaving behind Uluru, one of the largest monoliths in the world. The Algas, just 20 miles away, are a collection of 36 remnant outcrops made of conglomerate and formed in the same period. A hundred thousand million dawns have washed over this country. It has seen mountains rise and fall, seas and lakes flood and vanish, great forests spread to the horizon then fade away. There have been a succession of life forms from the dinosaurs of prehistoric times to the smaller, better adapted animals of today. Taller than a full-grown man, the red kangaroo bounds the Mulga Plains, king of this country. Reaching speeds of up to 40 miles an hour, mobility is the key in his constant search for food, mostly young grasses and new shoots. The wedge-tailed eagle is one of nature's great predators. The master of the bush undoubtedly is the dingo, a latecomer brought from Asia only around 5,000 years ago. Dingoes are cunning, dogged hunters, attacking anything from kangaroos and wallabies to insects and lizards. Moloch Horridus truly has a horrible look, all five inches of him. But this thorny devil's fierce appearance is simply a front to scare off stronger predators who'd like to make a meal of him. The frill-necked lizard is alarmed. He runs for cover, searching for a tree or bush, because that's where he feels safest, but there's none in sight. Parrots are a real feature of the Australian bush. They come in all sorts of shapes, colors and sizes but they have one thing in common. They're supremely adapted to survive the dry, harsh desert conditions. The desert is full of life. It provided Anangu with food, roots, berries and fruits, witchetty grubs and larger game. The Aborigines were expert managers of the land. They took only what they needed and moved on so the land could replenish itself. In the 1860s and 70s, explorers vied with each other to cross Australia from south to north. They were trying to find an overland route for the new electric telegraph. The desert was harsh and barren to the European, but it still had the ability to inspire intrepid men like the explorer Ernest Giles. I am sure this is one of the most extraordinary geological features on the face of the earth. For as I have said, it is composed of several enormous round stone shapes like the backs of several kneeling pink elephants. Cattlemen followed, but found the country too cruel, too hostile for their animals. Missionaries and dingo trappers came, and they too were beaten by the fierce desert. 
a place where daytime temperatures of 140 degrees in the shade could plunge to well below freezing on cold, frosty nights. But the majestic monoliths acted as a magnet for a curious people, an urban people starved of the magic and mystery of wilderness. Groups like this schoolboy's expedition began to arrive from all parts of the country. Camp is made at the base of the sheer wall. The radio mast goes up to confound the spirits of the primitive men who've made the rock for untold ages the focal point of their legends and ceremonials. From the 1970s on, Australians began to be more and more aware, both of the rights of Aborigines to their traditional lands and to their ability to manage it using methods that have long stood the test of time. In October 1985, to much rejoicing, the ownership of Uluru was handed back to the Aboriginal people of the area. Today, Uluru is one of Australia's major tourist attractions. Authentic, accessible and awesome. Nature can exist without man. Man cannot exist without nature. So wrote the haiku poet Kenchiki Kusimoto. The value that nature holds for all people is expressed in the many national parks that exist around the world. These parks reflect each country's story, its culture and history. Here, in the oldest continent on our planet, the National Parks of Australia provide the explorer with a lifetime of age-old memories and the opportunity to experience nature at close contact. In this bountiful country, Australia's national parks are its greatest treasures, for they allow us to enrich our bodies, our minds and our souls. Ayers Rock is one of the worldwide attractions of the National Parks of Australia. This enormous chunk of sandstone, some five and a half miles in circumference, is truly one of the world's wonders. Tourists by the busloads find it mysterious. But it's no mystery to the first Australians, the Aborigines. To them, this rock is the center of their universe. Its caves are the sacred dwelling places of their heroic ancestors. They believe that when the world was created, this rock arose out of the earth miraculously. I'm Gavin McLeod. I'll see you again as we explore another great park of the world.